మేడం కొద్దిగా జరగండి చాలా మంది వస్తుంది ఇలా ఇలా బీసీఎఫ్ లో వచ్చాడు బీసీఎఫ్ లో వచ్చాడు ప్లీజ్
Don't speak in that. Good morning to you, Professor Rao. Is uh, Professor Sudharani there? Dr. Lakshma Reddy? Good morning, Professor Rao. Can you please hear me? 
welcome okay i just want to be sure that you are able to hear me perfectly yeah, yeah. Sir, we are going to start the program within two minutes. No problem. I am at your disposal. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. I will tell you. Presentation. I don't have any PowerPoint presentation. I'm just going to be speaking. Yeah, welcome. Thank <laughs> you. Good morning, sir. Good morning, all the invitees and guests for Dr. B. R. Ambedkar 40th Foundation Day webinar lecture is being organized by Dr. B. R. Ambedkar Open University on the National Education Policy 2020 and the Future of Indian Universities by Professor C. Rajkumar Garu, Vice Chancellor, OP Jindal Global University, Haryana. It is my proud privilege to welcome all our guests and invitees for today's function. May I now welcome today's president of the program, Professor K. Sita Ramarao Garu, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, Open University. Once again, welcome you, sir. Now I welcome Professor C. Rajkumar Garu, Vice Chancellor, OP Jindal Global University, Haryana. Is uh, the today's chief guest is going to be deliver a lecture on the national education policy 2020 and the future of Indian universities. Welcome you once again, sir. I welcome now Professor E. Sudharani Garu, Director Academic, and Dr. G. Lakshmaredi Garu, Register of the University. And also I welcome all the directors, deans, heads of the branches, teaching and non-teaching fraternity various service associations, office bearers, and members of the university. I welcome you once again, one and all. Now I request Professor K. Sitarama Raugaru, today's president of the function, to kindly conduct the further proceedings. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 
సభకు నమస్కారం గుడ్ మార్నింగ్ ఎవ్రీబడి అట్ ది అవుట్సెట్ ఎక్స్టెండ్ వామ్ అండ్ బెస్ట్ విషెస్ టు ఆల్ ది పార్టిసిపెంట్స్ ఆఫ్ దిస్ ఫౌండేషన్ డే లెక్చర్ ప్రోగ్రామ్ అవర్ యూనివర్సిటీస్ ఫార్టీ ఎత్ బర్త్డే గ్రీటింగ్స్ సో వి హూ completed 39 years and we have entered into the 40th year this organization existed for four decades and in the service of the in the educational service of the society uh, at present we are serving both the telugu speaking states andhra pradesh and as well as telangana so over a period of 40 years we have provided education at the door steps of the people we in a way it is the first open university in india established by ap andhra pradesh legislature legislative act in 1982 founder vice chancellor was professor g ram reddy very popular educationist and known for founding father of distant education in india so sticking to the basic values of education and quality educational services ours is the first university to democratize the higher education in india earlier it was there in ivory towers it was thrown open to all to many people those who could not join for various reasons in the higher education so that is the contribution in both the states we have contributed to more than 15% of cross enrollment ratio in higher education so apart from this democratizing the higher education our university has committed and dedicated to the inclusive and quality education that is our uh, slogan of this 40th year and it is just now we have released the uh, logo in our uh, campus and we are going to use this logo for one year till august 20 next uh, august 26th of 2022 so coming to the today's program really i am very happy and i am delighted very much to invite professor sri rajkumar founder vice chancellor of op zindal global university and this is the first time we are meeting online and i never know him also physically but really within very short time i have become fan of professor rajkumar because i have gone through the various articles written by him on uh, implementation of the new national education policy 2020 and in collaboration with association of indian universities he submitted a, a good wonderful report how to go ahead with the implementation of the uh, new uh, national education policy in our india he gave many suggestions many useful workable implementable recommendations to governments and also 
universities and various other organizations to take active part in the implementation of the new education policy. That is the reason uh, in very short time, I have become a fan of uh, Raj Kumarji and really uh, am very much impressed and influenced also. One more thing is the founder and vice chancellor is continuing from, I think, uh, since 2009, established just 11 years old. That is the, before I came here to start, I gone through your video interview, gave to business world uh, just recently, and very interesting observations you have made in that. Uh, so uh, in 11 years, really you have made wonders, no doubt about that. It started, just started with 800 students. Now it is grown to more than 8,000 students with 12 schools, starting with single school. That is the contribution of Professor Rajkumar as a uh, dynamic academic leader. I do consider him as a dynamic entrepreneur in uh, institution building. So that is the point we have to understand. Uh, that is the reason uh, I have taken a decision to invite him to give the Foundation Day lecture, a 40th day Foundation lecture. People say that whether they are, they are individuals or organizations enter into a, when they enter into a 40th, it is a, a stage of maturity. From 40 years onwards, uh, we, when we go forward and we will get mature in our uh, behavior, in our uh, also taking decisions, implementing them, and various other reasons, definitely this 40th year is considered as one of the important landmark in the uh, organizational life. So, uh, now I don't want to take much of your time. I once again extend my uh, heartfelt thanks and also welcome on behalf of Dr. Rambedkar Open University on my personal behalf and also all our staff members, uh, we extend very heartful, uh, heartfelt welcome to you, sir. And uh, we request you to, uh, we are eagerly waiting to listen to you, uh, your uh, opinions, observations, and various uh, comments on the uh, education policy and its implementation and also about the uh, future of the university. But I want to say just one thing. Definitely the future of Indian universities are depending upon its transformation from single mode to multi-mode. From multi-mode university, multi-mode uh, teaching learning process and multidisciplinary uh, uh, institutions and also uh, at the same time, interdisciplinary approach and orientation towards uh, research and teaching learning. Unless we get transformed from this with a blended mode or hybrid mode, it is uh, definitely we have no future. The future depends upon that only. And apart from that, we must build uh, with the good uh, quality faculty, then only we can have a bright future. Uh, the next item on the agenda is I request our director academic, Professor Sudharani, to make a uh, brief introduction of the chief guest to the participants. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you once again. Thanks for your uh, acceptance and giving this Foundation Day lecture. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, everyone. At the outset, um, I congratulate all the teaching and non-teaching staff of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar Open University on its 40th 
Foundation Day. So it's a proud moment for all of us uh, to uh, express our uh, thanks to the uh, Vice Chancellor's, Founder Vice Chancellor, Professor J. Ram Redigaru's vision and uh, the mi mission of our open university to reach the unreached and um, all the uh, directors, deans, teachers, faculty, non-teaching faculty, and uh, including everything, the counselors, and at the most, uh, the most crucial is our learners. But for their support and continuous support and the faith in open and distance learning system, we could not reach this uh, heights uh, in this long 39 years. So this is a, a successful moment for all of us to celebrate. And uh, we salute those noble vision of the um, founder vice chancellor, as well as uh, we are uh, pledged to the mission of Dr. B.R. Ambedkar on whose name the university is renamed uh, in 1992. So um, being a part of this university uh, since a decennial celebration in from 1992 to till date, 30 uh, long years of my association with Open University gives me very pride in uh, uh, saying this. I've seen the ups and downs and seen the flour university flourishing with uh, many bright colors, bringing smiles on the lakhs of the uh, learners who are underprivileged students uh, from SCST minorities and the women who lost the opportunity of being educated, the homemakers, the farmers, the tribal people, I am the um, many of them uh, that uh, the mission of Dr. Bhimrao uh, Ambedkar that education ought to be brought to the reach of everyone. And uh, with this uh, mission, uh, university forwarded uh, with the uh, reaching the education or bringing the education to the doorstep of the learners. So this is uh, how we uh, have journeyed in this long years. And uh, it's a time to have a comprehensive reflection of our strengths and weakness on this day. And um, a very warm welcome to our uh, guest, chief guest, Rajkumar ji, uh, kind enough to uh, accept our invitation. And um, we have, uh, 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 I place it on record, the services of uh, the uh, several people who are, uh, who made, who brought smiles on the um, um, in the lives of the igniting the light of education and contributing Ambedkar University is contributing a lot uh, for the uh, increasing enrollment, gross enrollment ratio of the Telangana state and the uh, state of Andhra Pradesh because we serve both the states. And um, recently we have taken, uh, just now we unveiled the logo uh, dedicated to the inclusive quality education. And uh, to name the John Daniel rightly put, open education broke the iron triangle of access, cost, and quality that had constrained education since uh, in the in history uh, since many years. So this opportunity is given by the distance education um, uh, to serve the uh, underprivileged sections of the society. With this um, few words of mine, uh, it's my privilege to introduce the theme of uh, today's um, um, the history behind the Foundation Day lectures and. Um, we have been celebrating the Foundation Day lectures since 1997. Several luminaries, uh, intellectuals like R Professor Ramji Takwali, uh, Vice Chancellor and uh, A.M. Kushra, Chairman, Finance Commission, Government of India, former Finance Commission, uh, Commissioner, and uh, uh, Professor Gajraj Dhanrajanji, Professor Arya Chandrasekhar Rao, sir, Ket Vishwana Reddy, Reddy K. C. Reddy, uh, Professor G. Hargopal, uh, K. Kupuswami Rao, and um, Professor V.S. Prasad, and uh, uh, he gave twice the lecture, once in 2008 and uh, 2009, um, 10, and uh, recently last year also on national education policy. Uh, Professor P. Jayaprakash Prakash Rao, H. Professor Ranganath, Professor D.N. Reddy, Professor Murli Manohar, Professor V. Venkayagaru, Professor Suresh Gar, Pro Vice Chancellor Himalayan University, Itanaga, Professor uh, Nageshwar Rao, Vice Chancellor Putrak and Open University. Uh, University. Professor Jandihala B.J. Tilak and Professor E. Vainandan, uh, sir, uh, for 2019 and for 2020 also, Professor V.S. Prasad, uh, Vice Chancellor Igno, former Vice Chancellor Igno. Uh, during the pandemic time also, we have conducted online on national education policy. 
And uh, today also we are going to discuss on national education policy in the future of the universities, um, more particularly the ODL system also. Now it's my privilege and I'm happy to introduce uh, Professor Rajkumar Garu. Uh, Professor uh, C. Rajkumar, a Rhodes Scholar and a founding Vice Chancellor uh, of OP Zindal Global University India. Uh, he was appointed as, as Vice Chancellor at the age of a young age of 34. And in 2009, when the university was established, uh, Professor Kumar has an academic qualification from University of Oxford, uh, Harvard University, University of Hong Kong, uh, University of Delhi, and Lyla College. Professor Kumar conceived the idea of establishing India's first uh, global university with the visionary leadership and philanthropic support from uh, Mr. Naveen Zindal, established uh, JGU in Sonipat, Haryana in 2019. JGU is of uh, only 20 universities in India, one of the 20 university of India uh, and the only non-STEM and non-medicine uh, um, university which has been declared as institution of eminence uh, by the government of India. Professor Kumar is an accomplished legal scholar and works in the field of uh, human rights and development, comparative constitutional law, terrorism and national security, corruption and governance, law and disaster management, legal education, higher educa legal education and higher education. He has more than 200 publications to his credit, uh, seven books and uh, more than 160 uh, articles in the, um, uh, I, um, have been published in American University International Law Review, Asian Pacific uh, Review, Law Review, Australian Journal of Asian Law, Columbia Journal of Asian Law, Corporate Governance, this runs into many and uh, very prestigious uh, journals uh, he has published and uh, in England, in America, in uh, various countries. And uh, uh, he has authored uh, um, seven books, The Future of Indian Universities, uh, Education President, Institution Building of Nation Building and uh, so on. Uh, he contributed, uh, um, uh, con he was consultant to assignments in the field of human rights and governance. Uh, he was consultant to UN University, Tokyo, United Nations Development Pro UNDP, UN Office of Higher Commission of Human Rights, Geneva, and the International Council of Human Rights Policy, ICHRP. And uh, he has advised the commission to investigate allegations of bribery, corruption in Sri Lanka and National Human Rights Commission in India, NHRC in India. And uh, he serves the founding dean of Zindal Gro uh, Global Law School and the director of the International Institute of Higher Education Research and Capacity Building. And um, uh, the Zindal Global Law School has been ranked among 150th uh, within this short span of 11 years uh, law schools in the world and QS World University rankings in 2020. So it's a ranked the number one law school in India. And uh, this is uh, how, uh, like, you know, the, we are very happy uh, and uh, to have a uh, very learned and accomplished uh, vice chancellor uh, who is going to be with us for another one hour and deliberate upon various aspects of the future of Indian universities uh, in the context of the national education policy, which we have to gear up for the future development of our respective universities in India. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now, the next item on the agenda is the uh, today's uh, chief guest lecture. And now, I uh, sincerely invite Professor Rajkumar Ji uh, to deliver the 40th Foundation Day lecture today. Uh, thank you, sir. Thanks once again for your acceptance. I request you to deliver the lecture. Thank you, sir. A very good morning to all of you. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, extend my heartiest congratulations and greetings to all of you who are assembled here as we celebrate the 40th uh, you know, foundation day of the Dr. B.R. Ambedkar Open University in Hyderabad. Uh, it is such a momentous occasion for an institution of eminence, such as the Dr. B.R. Ambedkar Open University to have attained this very important and significant milestone. Um, 
in fact the extraordinary vision and the individuals who were part of the founding of the dr b r ambedkar open university laid the foundation for not only democratization of education but also providing access to education for thousands and thousands of youth across the country who simply would have been deprived the opportunity to be educated i would like to take this moment uh, to congratulate each one of you including the honorable vice chancellor professor sita ram rao uh, uh, dr lakshma reddy the registrar and of course professor sudha rani the director of the academic and of course all the deans uh, the faculty members uh, the stakeholders including the board members and also the learners uh, who are students of the dr b r ambedkar open university it is a truly a significant honor for me that you have bestowed upon me uh, to deliver the 40th foundation day lecture uh, let me begin by uh, paying a very important tribute to dr ambedkar uh, dr ambedkar for me uh, is not only a transformation leader but somebody who laid the foundations of indian republic today as we look at our neighbors across uh, in south asia but also in many parts of the world uh, constitutional uh, attempts or constitutional democratic attempts that were made years ago have not been able to sustain the test of time india continues to remain the beacon of hope for its uh, uh, rule of law framework and constitutionalism that was deeply embedded and all of us owe a debt of intellectual gratitude to dr ambedkar as the chairman of the drafting committee of the constituent assembly who laid the framework for our constitution when the constitution of india was adopted on 26 november 1949 by the constituent assembly its members were mindful of the challenges of governance uh, speaking after the completion of his work dr ambedkar the chairman of the drafting committee of the constitution said and i quote i feel that the constitution is workable it is flexible and it is strong enough to hold the country together both in peace time and in war time indeed if i may say so if things go wrong under the new constitution the reason will not be that we had a bad constitution what we will have to say is that man was wild and uncourt he essentially said that it is the people who would have failed the constitution and not the other way round now that visionary uh, words that dr ambedkar spoke was so critical because he essentially said that regardless of how our good the constitution is the ability for that constitution to succeed effectively will depend upon the kind of men and women who will be part of the nation building effort who will be part of the effort to build that new republic that we created the members of the constituent assembly including dr ambedkar recognized that the mere adoption of a good constitution would not culminate in the values of constitutionalism permeating the civic and political culture in the country nor could it ensure good governance yet there were great expectations that in the years to come the constitution would move from a document worthy of admiration to a solid commitment on the part of the power holders now it is this ability of constitutions to act as limitations on the exercise of powers and in that process delineate the functions of the government and outline the rights of the people that distinguishes the constitution from other legislation now the reason i wanted to bring this to today's speech is that it is important for us to create those enlightened responsible citizens who are able to fulfill the goals and aspirations of the constitution and how would we do that well that's where the education system comes it is the quality of education the values attached to the education the vision attached to the education the mission of education institutions all the way from schools to colleges to universities those aspects will form the foundations of enlightened citizenship who will be able to responsibly act and fulfill 
the vision of Dr. Ambedkar. So I would like to begin this lecture by paying tribute to Dr. Ambedkar, but all those people who are involved in creating our constitution and placing enormous trust on all of us as, as future citizens, future stakeholders of Indian democracy, and also all of us as educators adding an even more significant responsibility on our shoulders as we are educating young individuals who are going to help in the transformation of Indian society. It is indeed a very special moment as we celebrate the 40th uh, Foundation Day uh, of Dr. B.R. Ambedkar Open University in Hyderabad. And I am deeply inspired and truly impressed by the extraordinary contribution of the Dr. B.R. Ambedkar Open University in these 40 years. In fact, the motto of the university, education for all, is a very compelling, a very powerful, a deeply inspiring, a truly transformative vision that culminated in the very creation of this university. In fact, the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations, goal number four, talks about the idea of education, and that's much more contemporary in nature. In fact, the Dr. B.R. Ambedkar Open University's vision was far-sighted even in that time when it was established in the year 1982 to have the vision of education for all. Uh, also, I must confess that when I look at the contribution of the university all these years, I can only say that the university has fulfilled its vision and mission, but also it is constantly working towards providing access to people who simply may not have the possibility to learn. The 213 plus study centers spread across the states of Telangana and Andhra Pradesh, including the 23 plus regional coordination centers and the 14 plus centers exclusively focusing on women and students, women students, all of this are part of a vision to provide access to education for a large number of people who simply do not have that opportunity. So I would like to pay tribute to the vice chancellors, the faculty members from the past, but also the vice chancellors and registrar and other faculty members from today who are in many ways, uh, you know, uh, doing a human service uh, to the cause of institution building, which ultimately contributes to nation building. Let me move to the, uh, the theme of today's lecture. And I want to uh, keep it as tight as possible so that there are people who may know about the NEP. So let me begin by saying that the national education policy uh, was a truly remarkable watershed moment for India. A year ago, the government of India announced one of its most transformative public policy initiatives, the national education policy, whose vision states, and I quote, this policy envisions a complete overall and re-energizing of the higher education system to overcome these challenges and thereby deliver high quality education with equity and inclusion, both of those values being promoted by Dr. B.R. Ambedkar University. I quote further, the main thrust of this policy regarding higher education is to end the fragmentation of higher education by transforming higher education institutions into large multidisciplinary universities, colleges, and HEI clusters and knowledge hubs, unquote. So the National Education Policy 2020 has heralded a new imagination for the Indian higher education system. It has created an inspiring vision that has the potential to build and nurture truly world-class institutions and higher education institutions in India. However, as we know, this vision depends on our ability and commitment to the pursuit of systemic, systematic, synchronous, and sustainable reforms as envisaged in the policy. An equally important aspect of the higher education vision can and should be is what the Honorable Prime Minister of India has envisaged the evolution of what he has called the Atmanirbhar Bharat, and I will come back to it in a minute. Also, the world is slowly coming out of the pandemic. Universities are reimagining their vision, mission, and governance, wherein the safety, security, and well-being of the community ought to be of paramount interest. 
It's also important that their future viability as institutions of higher learning evolving to meet the realities of the post-pandemic world. In fact, Dr. The, Dr. Ambedkar uh, Open University has already addressed some of these issues in its 40-year journey, and we need to learn from some of those experiences as we look at what we call a hybrid mode of education, which is going to increasingly become the future. This is an opportune moment to improve the quality of higher education, to, to add more social relevance, to ensure a correlation between the important knowledge and the required skills that are necessary for being part of the professional workforce. Let me give you a brief outline of the NEP, and I'm going to keep it short and simple so that uh, we can understand what does the NEP uh, essentially envisage. So, there, are, in my view, there are 10 salient features of the National Education Policy 2020, and I'm going to give it in that order. First, it talks about a multidisciplinary, holistic, and liberal education. It refers to the importance of literary works such as Kadambari by Banabata, as per which good education is defined by knowledge of the 64 Kalas, and this emphasized on the study of art in the development of well-rounded students. Uh, it requires balancing of scientific fields, vocational fields, professional fields, liberal arts, and even soft skills. I am deeply inspired by this mission. Uh, I belong to a place called Kanyakumari in southern Tamil Nadu. I grew up in Chennai, and pretty much everybody uh, around me, uh, their main aspiration was to become a doctor or an engineer. And if they themselves don't have that aspiration, that aspiration is thrusted upon them by the parents, the relatives, and the society at large. Under these circumstances, to be able to talk about liberal arts, humanities, and social sciences is something quite extraordinary. And I'm happy that the national education policy has talked about it. That's the first. Second, enhanced student experience. One of the things that the national education policy has done is that it has brought the student to the center of the entire educational imagination. It has addressed the underlying constraints in improving the student experience. It has focused on the need for the development of curriculum, examinations, pedagogy, scholarships, emotional and physical well-being, and the entire institutional ecosystem that is critical to advance the goals and aspirations of the students themselves. The third aspect of the national education policy is about faculty development and teacher education. In fact, one of the tragedies of Indian higher education system, not now, but for a very long time, is that the best and the brightest of Indian higher education uh, graduates no, don't necessarily come into academia. Very unfortunately, and I'm sure many of you who are present here today will appreciate that, the aspiration to become a professor or a researcher is not a natural career objective for some of our bright students. Most of the time, those who probably don't get anything better, probably have failed in other career opportunities, probably could not get into their preferred choices, end up becoming teachers and researchers in our universities. And that ended up laying the foundation for institutionalized mediocrity that is deeply embedded and permeated across our higher education system. So the need for faculty development and teacher education was one of the most important salutary objectives of the national education policy. It has highlighted the importance and role of faculty in higher education. It focuses on the need for faculty autonomy, transparent recruitment, career development and progression, and also recognize the need for process improvement in teacher education to attract better talent into the education sector. The fourth feature of the national education policy is the aspiration, the goal to develop a research ecosystem. It highlights the role of research productivity and innovation in the national, in the nation building process. It has envisaged a transparent and a well-funded research in ecosystem through the centralized national research foundation. In fact, it has also envisaged significant increase in the resources and resource allocation when it comes to higher education, and we hope to see that happen. The fifth aspect of the national education policy is something that is very dear to me, which is to focus on regulatory reforms and the provision of autonomy to higher education institutions and universities. It has identified 
key reforms to streamline the management of regulations, establish, establish bodies with independent roles, and also eliminate any conflict of interest. The words that the national education policy has used, light but tight regulations to provide higher education institutions and faculty the desired autonomy. In fact, for far too long, we have recognized that the Indian higher education system is over-regulated and under-governed, and we need to reduce the regulation and improve the governance that is critical. The sixth aspect of the national education policy is the focus on balancing equity and equality and also promoting quality. In fact, it has balanced the issue of quality and equity of access. It has focused on reforms on curriculum and academic revisions. It has also emphasis on how to make our higher education institutions and the curriculum more inclusive and objective that the Dr. B. R. Ambedkar Open University has been pursuing quite vigorously since its very founding. The seventh aspect of the national education policy is the consolidation of higher education institutions. It has recognized that there are various challenges that come in managing over 50,000 higher education institutions across India today, with nearly 1,000 universities and some 45,000 plus colleges and number of other types of institutions regulated by the state or the center uh, or other types of institutions the Indian higher education system is extremely complex to navigate. It has recommended the formation of multi multidisciplinary universities or clusters that could focus on the consolidation of the Indian higher education sector. The eighth aspect of the Indian, uh, the national education policy is the focus on public funding and private philanthropy. It has strengthened the framework of funding to enable greater investment in higher education and also envisage the promotion of philanthropy. It has recognized the future of public-private collaboration. And in fact, as, uh, as the vice chancellor of a private university, I'm very conscious of the fact that far too long, privatization of higher education in, in, in India has been seen from a pejorative manner. It is, of course, recognized that a large number of private higher education institutions have indeed done things that they shouldn't have done and has brought the education uh, you know, imagination to lower levels. But it's important for us to move beyond those aspects and to create opportunities for the Indian higher education sector to grow together, both with public and private participation. The ninth aspect of the national education policy is about governance and leadership. This is an area which requires significant reform in India. The NEP has highlighted the importance of governance and leadership in both administration and institution building efforts. It has also focused on empowering the board of governors uh, as a part of that reform. In fact, these reforms began much earlier than the NEP. Uh, a few years ago, uh, the boards of IAMs were given more autonomy and alumni were able to participate more actively in those boards. There, was a, there has been a need for a focused vision of higher education institutions in the format of a well-formulated institutional development plan, which will, in many ways, charter the future course of action for Indian higher education institutions. The 10th aspect of the national education policy it was about internationalization, accreditation, and digital learning. These set of reforms have focused on aiming to strengthen the growth of internationalization and global partnerships with leading universities around the world. Uh, it also has emphasized on accreditation and high performance universities, including rankings, need for providing significant support for online distance learning, something that uh, uh, the Dr. B. R. Ambedkar Open University has been pioneering for years together. Uh, others have joined uh, largely due to the implications of COVID, but Dr. B. R. Ambedkar Open University uh, in its founding itself as a part of its vision and such other open universities are involved in it. Uh, it the NEP has focused on digitization of education in enabling greater equity of access to education. Very new platforms, including Swayam and other such platforms have been created, some of which before the advent of COVID-19 and some of which after it, 
nevertheless has been able to focus on these aspects. Having identified the 10 features of the national education policy, let me spend the next whatever time I have uh, to uh, focus on the public policy reforms that are necessary for successful implementation of the national education policy. The first is we need to empower universities with greater autonomy. Second, we need to ensure the regulatory freedom that they talked about. Third, we need to enable the university to raise significant financial resources, which includes different forms of interventions at the tax level. Fourth, energizing the university for innovation, entrepreneurship, and collaboration. Fifth, we need to globalize the Indian university. I don't see any reason why Indian universities cannot be the opportunity for higher education for students across Africa, Middle East, South Asia, and other parts of Asia. In fact, over 2,000 years ago, India had Nalanda, Takshashila, Vallabhi, and Vikramshila who the institutions which were truly global universities. They had faculty members and students from around the world coming and being part of these institutions which were part of the Indian civilization and heritage. The oldest university uh, in Europe, um, the Bologna University, which is nearly 1,000 years old, Oxford University where I studied, which is nearly uh, 800 years old, India had institutions long before, and I don't see any reason why we cannot reimagine the Indian university, the Indian higher education institutions to be globalizing and to provide opportunities for students from around the world. The sixth thing that we need to do is to develop strong international collaborations. Seventh, we should focus on excellence in research and publications. One of the tragedies of Indian higher education, which has also adversely impact on our aspiration to be ranked internationally is the relatively uh, you know, marginal focus on research with little opportunities for promoting scholarship and faculty publications. The eighth aspect of a reform that we need to focus on is to build strong state and local level institutional capacities. We cannot be only focusing on the IITs, the IIMs, the central universities, while they are truly institutions of excellence, we need to focus on other universities across the country, including other types of delivering education, such as the innovations that are taking place in Dr. B. R. Ambedkar University in Hyderabad. Ninth is we need to focus on international rankings and global benchmarking. And the 10th is to, we need to break the public-private university divide. Now let's quickly go to the current status of NEP. Now the first year of the NEP, focused on three efforts that were needed to effectively implement the policy in the context of higher education institutions. First, galvanization of intellectual consciousness among the stakeholders regarding the vision and objectives of the NEP. This was essential and the effort was led by the Honorable Prime Minister and the Education Minister reflecting the seriousness of the government's intent to implement the policy. Second, to develop internal capacities within the ministry and other regulatory bodies. This is a sine qua non for effective implementation, implementation of NEP, since it would not be possible to have the same organizational structure with the same set of individuals having the responsibilities to implement the NEP. This is a very important aspect that has been undertaken for the last one year. Third, important reform initiatives as a prelude to the implementation. Now, while the COVID-19 crisis created the necessary impetus for the education sector to innovate, the education ministry and other regulatory bodies such as the UGC announced a number of new and progressive regulations to promote online education, including empowering select universities to offer 100% online degrees, something that the open universities, such as the Dr. B. R. Ambedkar Open University has been doing for a very long time. The institutions of eminence, such as us, were also empowered to have more flexibility in online education, but more needs to be done in this regard. The Academic Bank of Credit has created a foundation to bring 
the much needed flexibility in study programs for the benefit of the students. So the first year of the NEP was challenging given that schools, colleges, and universities switched to online mode of education, which was the only option available. The scenario created huge challenges to access education due to the digital divide that is widely prevalent in India. The fact is only less than 15% of Indian households have the three things that are needed to promote online education. First, a reasonably uninterrupted electricity. Second, a reasonably uninterrupted or you know, uh, uh, effective Wi-Fi. And third, a reasonably working equipment. And the reality is the COVID-19 crisis has further accentuated the deep divisions, the inequalities that are prevailing in the education sector and has solidified them very unfortunately. And that's why we need to act swiftly. Let me quickly address the implementation challenge itself. The implementation of any policy, I believe, requires enormous political will and leadership, bureaucratic support and coordination, along with a sense of acceptability that promotes participation among all stakeholders, which is us who are part of the academic institutions. Well, the last year helped advance some efforts. There are some challenges that need to be addressed. First, creation of new institutions. It is absolutely critical to create new institutional mechanisms at the national level that are vested with the responsibility of implementing the NEP. These could be in the form of committees, working groups, or even advisory bodies that will be responsible to implement different aspects of the NEP. It will be a mistake to assume that existing institutional capacities that are available within the ministry and in other regulatory bodies can fulfill the task of implementing the NEP. Second, significant legislative and statutory reform initiatives. One of the major challenges of implementing any policy in the absence of legislative backing and statutory support is its inability to effectively implement them. If this aspect of the NEP is not dealt with immediately, I believe it runs the risk of being challenged in the court of law, leading to inordinate delays and undermining its implementation in, the ex in an expedited manner. The Higher Education Commission of India that has been envisaged in the NEP needs a legislative framework, while many other proposals in the NEP may also require some form of statutory backing. Third, stronger recognition of the role of state governments and private higher education institutions. A large number of higher education institutions are under the state government. They need to play an active role. Nearly 70% of higher education institutions in India are in the private sector, when we include universities and colleges. Believe it or not, over 70% of students in India are studying in private higher education institutions. The entire governmental machinery, including the education ministry and all other regulatory bodies, need to recognize the substantive and significant role of the state governments in a federal structure like India and private higher education institutions for the successful implementation of the NEP itself. All right, how do we redesign the implementation of NEP 2020? Well, the first anniversary of the launch of NEP 2020 heralded a new opportunity for focusing our attention on implementation. The Prime Minister gave a speech a few weeks ago, and of course, many others, including UGC and AICTE and other regulatory bodies also did their bit. I believe, that the existing mechanisms that are available for the implementation of NEP are inadequately designed for building a collective and unified approach towards implementation. We need the following new and imaginative institutional design that will help the implementation of the NEP in an, in an, in an expedited manner. The new institutional design for effective policy implementation in education should have five components, and I'll quickly run it with you. First, political leadership at the highest level of the government to monitor the implementation of the NEP. Second, leadership at the level of the education ministry to focus on the bottlenecks and challenges for effective implementation. Three, leadership at the level of regulatory bodies with the UGC taking the lead and bringing together all other regulatory bodies and subject-based councils to focus on implementation. Four, 
activating the state higher education councils and the state government's higher education departments for ensuring greater attention towards implementation. And five, empowering organizations such as the Association of Indian Universities to work closely with the vice chancellors of all universities towards the NEP implementation. All right, let me move to the last bit of my lecture, future of universities and plan of action. There is a national consciousness that has developed in the last year around the NEP. While there will be disagreements on certain aspects of NEP among stakeholders, I must say majority of the recommendations have been welcomed. The following should become the plan of action for NEP implementation in the near future. The NEP should be empowered to take complete ownership and the, the higher education institution should be empowered to take complete ownership and assume leadership in the implementation of the NEP. This is essential. The nature of policy implementation requires empowerment at the ground level. Strong institutional incentives should be developed to promote the implementation of the NEP. Incentives could be financial, but need not be limited to only that. The concept of graded autonomy that was promoted by the government of India could be linked to the effective implementation of the NEP. While empowerment of the HEIs and provision of incentives will form the core of the plan of action, these efforts need to be continuously monitored and assessed. But the monitoring and feedback mechanisms involving quasi-governmental organizations are also essential. Let me quickly say that in the context of India, I propose a few important dimensions for policy implementation and decision-making processes to be strengthened. First, it should create awareness among all stakeholders. Second, we should build consensus among institutions. Third, we should develop institutional mechanisms to support the policy. As I conclude, I would like to propose five steps that will ensure that the NEP is implemented effectively in a time-bound manner. First, Prime Minister's Advisory Council on the implementation of the NEP. The Honorable Prime Minister has spoken on several occasions about the NEP 2020 and its transformative potential for the future of India. To take advantage of the demographic dividend, this must be led from the highest levels of state apparatus. The PMAC, as I call it, should be chaired by the Honorable Prime Minister, and that will be the nodal agency to coordinate with all other institutions to ensure successful implementation of the national education policy. Second, the Union Education Minister's Steering Committee on the Implementation of the NEP. Constituted in the Ministry of Education, the EMSC will be, should be working closely and continuously with all stakeholders to identify and resolve bottlenecks in the implementation stage. The EMSC chaired by the Union Education Minister should be responsible for taking complete ownership of the implementation process and will work closely with all other regulatory bodies. Third, National Higher Education Minister's Council for the implementation of the NEP. We have a similar example in the GST, for example. The GST Council is chaired by the Union Finance Minister. Along with it, the state finance ministers are present. We need to have a similar focus, attention on education as well. The National Higher Education Minister's Council is a very important initiative that I believe needs to be created with all education ministers of states chaired by the Union Minister of Education with the Union Education Secretary as its member secretary. The success of the NEP depends significantly on the work that must take place across the states of India. There is a need for state governments to work closely with the central government. Four, empowered standing committee on legal and regulatory reforms for the implementation of the NEP. A gap between the vision of the NEP and the existing legal and regulatory framework is a major challenge in implementation, which requires intervention. Chaired by the Union Education Secretary, the ESC should be empowered to promote and propose legal and regulatory reforms across the education sector to implement the NEP. Lastly, there should be a vice chancellor's working group for the implementation of the NEP. The vice chancellors and directors represent the most important constituency for the implementation of the NEP in higher education. This VCWG under the chairmanship of the UGC chairman with members as select VCs and directors of higher education institutions can work to work together to implement the NEP. 
every effort in public policy making requires significant impetus and capacity building. These measures will ensure that we create a robust institutional architecture that will leave no stone unturned in the process of NEP implementation. The inspiring and imaginative vision of the NEP 2020 can be effectively implemented only if we are ready to establish institutional mechanisms outlined above to build the necessary capacity. As I conclude the Foundation Day lecture, I would like to say that the vision of an Atmanirbar University and an Atmanirbar higher education system in India is truly inspiring. It combines the vision of John Henry Newman's the idea of a university with the Humboldtian imagination of the modern research university from Germany to create the new global university, which is multidisciplinary, democratic, inclusive, aspirational, and international to cater to the needs and aspirations of a new India. It also addresses the most important question raised in these times for universities wide worldwide. How is global higher education being shaped and reimagined in the middle of the pandemic? And how will the higher education sector reform and transform in the post-pandemic world? In conclusion, I would like to say that India needs to accept that we can fulfill this vision only if we are prepared to take the full responsibility of what it takes to become an Atmanirbar Bharat. It has been a pleasure for me to deliver the Dr. B.R. Ambedkar 40th Foundation Day Lecture. Congratulations and my very best wishes to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you once again. Really, it is very uh, interesting lecture on our 40th Foundation Day. Uh, within a short span of time, you have covered many aspects of uh, not only national education policy and also its implementational challenges. And combined with the uh, future of our Indian universities. You have given us very valuable uh, suggestions and also recommendations to how best we can transform ourselves to cope up with the challenge of implementation of the uh, new national education policy and also uh, reform ourselves to become a world class universities. As you have seen, it's like okay, sir. Some small problem is here. So, uh, however, uh, unless we transform ourselves at this stage, and our future of universities are also at uh, the problem. So, we need to. Uh, understand the present situation and also change ourselves to the uh, changing needs of the society and also the students community and all that. So thank you once again, sir. Uh, really, we are very happy and delighted for your immediate consent, accepting our uh, request and invitation and gave us a very inspiring uh, 40th Foundation Day lecture, sir. Thank you once again. But uh, I don't think I should make any presidential uh, remarks at this stage. So we had a very, not only your lecture is informative and it is very analytical and thought provoking also to think and analyze ourselves how to go ahead from here onwards. Thank you once again. We, so small, one thing is that we are, today we have uh, inaugurating our new newsletter, sir, uh, today. So every, 
Every quarterly we bring our newsletter. Uh, we produce four newsletters every year. So after I have taken the charge in, in second term, this is the first new newsletter we are releasing. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So thank you once again, sir. So now the last item of the agenda is uh, proposing formal vote of thanks by our honorable registrar, uh, Dr. So, Lakshman Reddy. I request- so Professor, to... Professor Rao, before uh, uh, Dr. Reddy delivers the vote of thanks, yeah. I have a very important uh, request. Okay, sir. Uh, I wanted you not to equate this invitation that you've extended to me uh, in online. I, ah. At the earliest opportunity, I want to visit your campus Thank you and very much, spend sir. time with all of you. <laughs> Please welcome. At any time, you are welcome. Kindly give us one day or two days notice. We will get ready to receive you and show our campus also. It will be my pleasure. It will be my pleasure. Ah. And we are also planning to go for NAC accreditation by next year. Next by the foundation by the next foundation day program, definitely we will complete our NAC accreditation process, and we are aiming at a, a better academic grade of accreditation. Wonderful, sir. wonderful, very good. Very much. Congratulations. Now I request our Dr. G. Lakshmariti Registrar to propose formal vote of thanks to this program. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It is my privilege to deliver the vote of thanks at this. Dr. Brow Foundation Day celebration. First, I would like to thank our speaker, chief guest, Professor C. Rajkumar Garu, Vice Chancellor O.P. Jindal University for his excellent thought-provoking speech. I also thank our beloved Vice Chancellor for sharing his thoughts. I also thank Professor Sudharani, Sudharani Madam, also other dignitaries and colleagues for their participation. I once again thank everyone for making this program a grand success. Thank you. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, sir. Thank you to all of you.